Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Lou Tucker. I'm a VP and CTO of Cloud Computing at Cisco Systems. And uh, thank you for coming to the session. Today what I wanted to, to, to talk about, and I think we've seen a lot of this, and much of this will probably be a repeat, but maybe what I'm gonna try to do is give you some color of my view on, on what we're doing here with OpenStack. But it's really looking at how OpenStack, I think over the last couple of years, and in the near future, will continue to expand in a lot of different market opportunities, a lot of different applications. It's not just an ordinary cloud platform anymore. We really are, in many ways, I view this as becoming verticalized into a couple of very interesting industries. At the same time as what we're doing is that we're increasingly aggregating a lot of new technology that's coming about even over the, the, the four or five years that, that OpenStack has been around. So I think actually, Jonathan, you know, we're, we're all, you know, talking about these disruptions that are happening in, in the industry today. And these waves of innovation that are fueling companies, like we saw Uber mentioned uh, earlier, and we saw, you know, uh, Airbnb, these are major disruptions of, of industries that are happening because of these uh, technology innovations that we've had that allowed new business models to arise and other and what, uh, people, you know, and allowing people to approach these problems in very different ways. So that we've also seen, you know, the entire, you know, who goes to a store to rent a CD anymore? It's all being delivered down by Netflix. Um, Amazon now is becoming the largest retailer almost in the world, delivering things again through, you know, the internet, purchasing through the internet and delivering then even in the same day delivery through logistical, large logistical centers around the world. So all of this is in many ways, I think, you know, just driven by the internet and by cloud computing. And the reason why that's so is that the internet gives us the reach. We can now address very, very large audi uh, audiences, marketplaces, and cloud computing allows us to do it with a very small number of people. So when those two things come together, the internet and cloud computing, you have the possibilities that very small companies can take on very large industries and go after the entire marketplace. And that is something that I think we are all a part of. And, and Mark Andreessen made this point back sort of in 2011 that essentially software is eating the world. And it could eat into all of these different businesses. And that's what people are experiencing today. And that there's no notion that software itself, because of the ability for us to rapidly create software, um, requires a lot less capital intensive businesses. We can approach these businesses in new ways because it's driven by software and those. So all of you who are developers, you've got a very, very bright future because software really is taking over more and more of the traditional enterprises. And so if we think about this in another way that we've already passed that, that time period in which now there are more virtual machines than physical servers out there. Traditional IT departments, you'd measure the growth of IT or whatever by how many servers, how many networking ports and things like that. And now it's a number of virtual machines. What's kind of interesting about virtual machines, as you know, they come and they go, they disappear. They may be around only for a couple hours or a couple of days. Um, so it's a very different model that we're talking about provisioning now resources. It's on demand, uh, it's self-service. None of us like to file a trouble ticket or call up somebody on the phone to get resources for us. We wanna be able to, to go to an API and, and type in a command and get resources provisioned for us. And so it started actually in, actually virtualization, as you know, it goes way back to IBM mainframe days. And when it started in the enterprise, it was still essentially run by IT organizations. So you still had to file a trouble ticket, but now the IT organization's job was easier because now they could actually just spin up a couple of virtual machines for you instead of racking and stacking servers. I think the big change in cloud computing was when that became self-service. And that's what I think we have Amazon to thank for. Their model was a self-service model and everything just like FedEx. No longer are you calling up to see how you track your package. You've given a link in an email and you click on the link and you can now track your own package. Well, that saved FedEx an awful lot of money and I provided you with a great service. So the notion of self-service combining again with the virtualization technology, I think really sparked this whole change in, in cloud computing. And then people started you know, looking at it, and like, guys like Joe Wyman, if you've read any of his material, really looking at it from the point of view of economics. And from an economics point of view, you can start talking about things such as, you only have a certain amount of sustained capacity you need every day, and then you have peaks around holiday seasons, 
or, or anything else. So the notion of hybrid cloud starts to come about where you are using resources, not only that you own or that you lease for long term, but also then you, through peaks and valleys here, you can more accurately match the demand curve with your cost curve. That directly translates into profit for companies. And so that's why there's a strong, strong economic foundation behind everything that we're doing in cloud computing. And something else happened. Not only was this a different way to do the same kind of computing we used to be doing, now we changed infrastructure, but we started looking at these cloud native applications. And so this changed sort of the design paradigm for building applications. You started to think immediately about the fact that on these virtual machines, since you can spawn them up or, 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 or kill them off over time, you can make it dynamically elastic. And so that became an integral part. And when you're dynamically elastic, that also means you can recover from failures. If a couple of those virtual machines that are on servers that have a problem or you've got a disk failure or something, it doesn't matter because you have a fleet of virtual machines that you're dealing with. So a lot of the resiliency of applications started moving resiliency of the application moved into that application layer and was less dependent upon the resiliency of the underlying infrastructure platform. Because we know at scale, those kinds of failures are just going to happen every day. And you have to have a service that's running nonstop. So the notion of these kind of cloud native applications, application design patterns started to come about. Okay, so now we virtualized everything. We are running your own infrastructure in the cloud. And I see like we have got Ryan Herod here who's been doing it and one of our super users. Uh, look, talking about the WebEx platform and a lot of things he talks about are the fact that now, even though you virtualize that, some of the things are, are very much the same. You still have to operate it. So you are now still operating your virtual machines. And so the notion of DevOps is, is really paramount here at two different layers from the system provider point of view where you have code driving the infrastructure. And then again, at the application layer where you have operational concerns about keeping these things up. And so whenever you have operations, you have operational costs. The way you control operational costs is through automation. The way you get automation, again, is through software. So it all ties back to this, this whole notion, I think, that Andreessen was talking about several years ago. It's interesting to look in the, in the past a bit here, over OpenStack, because we've seen now over the years the number of different applications and, and industries that we're talking about that now we are seeing being addressed by OpenStack. We've got, it's not just cloud providers. Most of these are not cloud providers. In fact, when you're providing open source software, that's so anybody can run that software, and so people are building all of their, their private clouds within the enterprise. They're running clouds to run e-commerce operations, even so, we see like Bloomberg and Comcast and Best Buy. These are major industries. We saw you know, Walmart talk about their, their fleet of you know, over 100,000 cores that they're running now. So this is all now very, very possible. It still requires quite a bit of work because this is still very new technology uh, that we're talking about. But these companies, uh, unlike Nicholas Carr's does, you know, statement many years ago, does IT matter? Well, for these companies, IT matters a lot. As a matter, it's fundamental to them because they are out to disrupt other companies with IT. And so that becomes a very important role that we have in terms of making, that, making OpenStack continue to address these kinds of applications. So in some way, I think that we now are, are seeing OpenStack becoming this new layer in the data center. Uh, we are looking at a, at a point, we had physical data center, we sort of had administration and orchestration and operational tools usually managing that physical infrastructure. And now on top of that, we layer a set of OpenStack services. And it's not just a compute service. It's not just a compute and a storage service or a compute storage and a networking service. This is over time moving into database services, moving into message bus services. I think that over time we'll increasingly see things such as Monaska coming up, which is talking about big data pipelines for you to be able to process your logs and events and everything else. So all of these become services, and in fact, that's the new platform. Those of you who followed any of the, what I've been talking about for a couple of years, uh, I always objected to NIST's definition of platform as a service. You had infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. I just thought the platform part we got wrong. It should have been services become the platform. 
That's what I think is really happening, so that when people now are building applications, they're drawing upon a number of different services. And the competition now is, do you have those services in your cloud? Do you have those services available to your users? Because that's what makes the developer's job easier. Nobody wants to stand up their own database anymore if you can have one provided as a service. So those are the kinds of things that accelerate the application development that, that is going on. You know, at the same time cloud computing was coming about, there was another shift happening in the industry, and that's around software-defined networking. Uh, we've all heard about OpenFlow and how the same model that we were talking, the, 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 the model around virtualizing resources that we saw applicable in the compute space is now being applied into the networking space. And so this allows the kind of perfect storm between software-defined networking happening and cloud computing happening and so that now companies and some of you know, the largest like carriers are looking at network function virtualization. They're saying the net, what that means if you decode that NFV is really talking about those traditional network services that we all use as, in applications, load balancers, firewalls, VPNs. Those are becoming virtualized now so that they can be dynamically spun up instead of having to make a phone call saying, please provision my you know, company with VPN services. You can do that through self-service. You can dynamically scale those services, and you can reduce the operating cost for the provider, which means that they should be passing those cost savings on to the consumer as well. So these things are, are, are coming about at the same time and colliding with, with cloud computing. So what do we see? Again, open source, I think, is one of the other real drivers of this, of this change as well. And so we're seeing even open source now moving into the world of, of divining, you know, designing these uh, network controllers. So open daylight now is really growing up and coming on very, very fast, where a lot of the functionality we want in all of this networking will be in, encompassed by these controllers. And so this has a lot of the same constituents as OpenStack, that is we're getting together and we're designing this kind of an open source network controller that we all can use and then plug into different infrastructures to provide these kinds of network, work, network functions. If you look at Neutron itself, it's rather interesting. Uh, we started this uh, very, um, more than like three or four years ago at something called Quantum originally, now is Neutron. And this was a way to say, let's make networking as a service. That's actually something new. It, we had no real model to go after, so it's been through a couple of iterations. And what we see here it was designed very early. We wanted to enable multiple technologies with SDN coming on. We wanted it to be able to you know, accommodate OpenFlow. We wanted it to also accommodate traditional networking. If you have just got standard networking out there, it should work with standard networking as well. And a lot of different models. So in fact, there's over 40 plugins that are built into Neutron today, provided by a lot of the different vendors and different open source communities which allow people to essentially plug and replace the different networking components that they would like to have. And I think that we're going to see, continue to see a lot of change in this area. In fact, in Europe, there's a standards body called EPSI, who is defining what, they, what a virtualized network service, network function virtualization, should look like architecturally. So standards bodies are getting involved here because they want to define a reference standard or architecture here that would allow multiple companies to adhere to this and plug in so that the consumer of these could plug in different components from different, different vendors. And so this is work that, that is coming out of that. On the code side, so that's a standard body. On the code and the implementation, now that is being done by OpenNFV. And in concert with, with our summit here, we've also had a day with the OpenNFV folks as they're looking to build a reference architecture around network function virtualization. So this is, this is something four years ago we weren't even thinking of when we were starting OpenStack. That was going to be a cloud platform for IIS. Now we're looking at it also being able to accomplish being the, the platform, the virtualization platform for network function virtualization. Entirely different space. To do that, even on the foundation side and the rest of the community here, we've had to spin up different groups. OpenStack has to now get to be carrier grade enterprise ready. The resiliency of the platform itself becomes really important. So there's a lot of work that is being done and I think that we'll continue to see going forward and I urge you to work behind a lot of the blueprints that we're bringing out to really make OpenStack resilient, have the same kind of 
of uptime that you'd expect to have in a carrier space or in the enterprise space. The other day I had a talk actually with Bank of America. And it's interesting, even the banks are getting involved in this most traditional part of IT. And what they're looking for, they are very much behind this notion of a software-defined data center, software-defined infrastructure. They want to think of their entire IT infrastructure as being driven by software. That means they can automate it to reduce the cost. That means they can be more agile. They can roll out new services to their branches, as the bank, to, to new branches that are showing up in shopping malls or pop-up stores around the world. They want to rapidly provision new services, and they can only do that through software. Lowering, they have to be very cost conscious, so it has to be fully automated. And they have to de-risk their investment. And one principal way of de-risking their investment is to go to an open source platform, such as OpenStack, where we have mul they can get a solution from multiple vendors. And they don't tie necessarily their new services or their applications to a particular vendor and be held hostage. They like the fact that it's multi-vendor and participation by broad aspects of the industry. So in many ways, you know, configuration and cabling, those of you who have ever worked in IT or worked in data centers know the nightmare that this is, and that's now being replaced by code. And that's what this whole software-defined infrastructure is largely about. So that you can have Yang models, you can have formal ways of expressing what you want the infrastructure to look like. And instead of sending guys out there with the trouble ticket, that they have to review and cut and paste from one system into another system of record and a CMDB, they can express it now through a software model. And that software model becomes the model that then the rest of the orchestration system is supposed to make the infrastructure look like. And we're always looking then at the difference. So that when there are failures, you can say there's a failure here because what we're actually running doesn't look like the model. And we, and we can produce that kind of a feedback loop. So the other notion that's somewhat is sort of the holy grail in IT in many cases. You would like it to be policy. You don't even want it to be this you know, JSON file or Yang model or whatever. You would like it to be expressed as a policy, the intent of what you would like to have. You would like to have the intent expressed through these mechanisms so that you can say, these web servers, will they have to talk to the internet, but my database server is always behind does, has no connection to the internet. So that you can talk about the policies that you would like to see enforced. You would like to be able to say, the front end of these servers here, which is some internal service, has both a firewall and has a load balancer, so that any of those individual nodes could go down and the service continues to run. That's intent, and that's a policy. So there's, there's many efforts underway. Uh, Cisco's been uh, very heavily involved with group-based policy. Uh, which is APIs that now allow you to express groups, sets of servers, your web front ends, your middle messaging tier, perhaps, and your back end database. Those are groups. And you don't talk about the individual IP addresses. You talk about traffic from this set should be able to go to this set of, uh, filtered by these following rules. And that's the intent that you'd like to do. So a lot of the, the mistakes that we make when we get down to translating intent into configuration or in even config files, is alleviated because you're instead talking about intent. And that intent can apply then in wherever this application might be put inside of the infrastructure. And your binding sort of with the IP addresses and everything else starts to go away. There's all the other things in terms of policy. Uh, Congress is another effort underway to really define even a more higher level policy across both applications and services and, and infrastructure. And OpFlex then reflects policy going down into the individual devices. So watch this space over the next several years. As more and more applications, you want to find another level of efficiency through this kind of automation by, again, what, as computer scientists, what are we always doing? We're abstracting things so that we can talk about them in a way that removes the dependencies upon the underlying layers. And so policy, I think, would be a very important aspect of that. A couple of weeks ago, I went to Las Vegas for, for the NAB show, National Association of Broadcasters. I don't know if you've ever happened to be in Vegas when this show is going on, but it is huge. It's like CES. It's one of those things that takes over a large part of the city. 
And since this is all about media and broadcast and TV, you know, there's big screens, flashy screens all over the place, and the latest movies and, and sitcoms and TV shows are being talked about. This entire industry has been built on hardware appliances. You couldn't use general purpose computing. You were doing transcoding, video ingest. You were doing broadcast where latency is, is paramount. High bandwidth is required. And so that, that's just in, in the show itself, we're seeing the set of companies that a couple years ago started looking at it and going, you know, look at what happened in other industries. And we're going to see the same thing happen in ours and it's going to start to virtualize. So these functions, if you're transcoding, every time that we come up with, an, you know, to get the standard broadcast out to this and out to all of the other devices, that's different encodings that we have to take place upon, even accommodating for different bit streams and bandwidths. So all that video pipelining now, which has been done on hardened appliances, is moving into the cloud computing realm. So we see things, for example, today, that those applications that were in these fixed appliances are now moving into virtualized pipelines. And some of the early movers there are doing this on OpenStack. So I find that particularly exciting, because here again is a whole other industry now that's starting to move to cloud computing. And so that five years from now, NAB show will look very different. It'll look more like a software show, where people are showing the tools and everything else, where much of this now is virtualized. And so obviously the, the advantages you get, you know, is that you're cutting down from, from weeks to minutes. Um, one of the things, things in the broadcast space, this is all real time. Uh, many, many years ago, I worked on real-time signal processing, and there are real strict constraints. You, I mean, you just have to be on there. You can't lose frames in broadcast. Uh, so you really have new things. But at the same time, they have workload requirements. They have 45 movies they just got in, and they have to transcode and encode and get them ready by Friday. So they've got huge demands in terms of the quantity of, of, of work that they're trying to achieve in a fixed period of time. So the orchestration of those different components and the resource allocation and scheduling, placement of those services becomes very, very important. So here's another industry that's being, I think, disrupted by cloud computing and by OpenStack. And I think this one will be a very interesting one to come. Another change, how do we develop code? Uh, we've all seen, uh, in the, even in this conference, you know, a lot of talk now about containers. And we've seen actually you know, the whole VC world and everything else get rally around a lot of new companies who are looking at the code development process from the time you sort of have an idea and, and how you can package that up. Can you share components with other, other parts of, of the industry? You know, in the, in the electronics industry itself, those of you who ever did like circuit board work or VLSI design or whatever, we had standard libraries and we had components and reusable pieces of hardware. And we're trying to get that same kind of reuse now in something which is con kind of containers. But we've seen a lot of things now start to come out here. So it's not just in Docker, but Kubernetes and Mesos uh, and CoreOS. So we're starting to see a different layers of this come together. So it has layers, and we saw even the demos during the, during the keynotes, of now application libraries where you can bring these things into your system very readily. You can containerize these, and you can deploy them. And at the same time, we're seeing operating systems are getting skinnier and skinnier because they don't have to support now everything in the world. They can really support much more narrowly cast applications. So I think this is a very exciting area uh, that we see. And a lot of people, when they're looking at this, Look at it, so you know, it starts to look like a cloud. So in fact, a lot of things, if you look at Mesos and, and, and other uh, platforms such as that, it's a distributed operating system. So it's an operating system that is running actually on top of an operating system, but it's distributed across a data center, and it has resource scheduling capabilities in it. You can say, I want to have five copies of this application running at all time, and it will use Zookeeper and other things to make sure that that application always has five instances of it running. So if one should go away, it can automatically start up another. So a lot of the distributed computing work that's been done over the years in different systems, I think, is starting to sediment down into these new layers, making it, again, easier and easier for application developers to get their job done. 
And then so as we start to think about this, the question is, is there a battle here? Many people right now, and I think that you see even reports out there, is that, you know, Docker and containers and Mesos and Kubernetes is going to kill off cloud computing. And I actually don't find that ever to be the case with technology. Technology has a wonderful way of taking the best from every different piece and use it for the most appropriate use. So I think in some, some uses, absolutely, it will be fully just containerized. But then it's not really designed for the whole kind of multi-tenant notion that we have in a cloud. So in fact, if you look at the differences between virtual machines and containers, there's some very primary ones. And, and so virtual machines, we think, are fat. They're heavy. So on top of a host, you're running now an operating system. And depending upon type 1 or type 2 hypervisor, that allows you to create a virtualization layer. Through Libvirt, you can talk to that. And now you, the customers bring a virtual machine on top. That virtual machine thinks it's running on hardware. Because what did we do with a hypervisor? We're emulating a hardware layer. So through that emulation, it makes it possible to run an operating system and an application, let's say which might be Linux, next to another one that's running Windows. Because we're emulating at the hardware layer. And this, is, this was the, the brilliance, I think, of virtualization. And allowed us to do the stacking of application and dramatically increase utilization of, of, our, of our servers. Containers, on the other hand, really do this at the operating system layer itself. So here you are able to do segmentation of, through namespaces and C groups and others so that you actually are running simultaneously two different applications that sharing the op operating system, by and large, but may have different user libraries, may have different libraries in terms of which, level, which Python um, uh, release you're running. That allows much lighter weight, sharing of resources, greater utilization in terms of the memory overhead. You're not carrying around the whole operating system with you wherever you go. Um, but again, it doesn't now allow you to run Windows and Linux applications on top of a common operating system because there isn't one. So they each have their use. And it's important for us when we're designing applications to know when we want to use one technology versus, versus the other. What's even more interesting is that when they're used together. Um, and what I'm particularly intrigued by, so you've seen work um, through things such as Magnum, where we're talking about, well, what if every tenant, what if we could have a service, and a tenant comes into the service and says, spin me up a Kubernetes environment, cluster, Kubernetes cluster, or dark, Docker Swarm cluster, and be able to spin that up, and that's owned by that tenant, whereas another tenant can bring in their own cluster, and again, running on top of virtual machines. So this is where the cloud computing model and the, the container model comes together. In fact, when you're running containers, if you've done an experiment you know, on Amazon or Google, that's actually the model you're using. We can talk about then those virtual machines as getting smaller and smaller and smaller, but they're still providing, there's still hyper hypervisor-based isolation between virtual machines, but they can get to be very small. What's interesting with OpenStack, particularly in the Kilo release now, we're also really pushing in bare metal hosts. And so through Ironic, now with some things like Magnum, you can start talking about running these on top of bare metal, which essentially means all you've done is sort of partition, again, your host resources to, by tenant to giving them capabilities of running a, a pure kind of, of container environment. So Magnum is one of the projects I urge you to take a look at and get involved in. Um, we're heavily involved in this uh, from Cisco's point of view. And this is really containers as a service, uh, according to the model we just talked about, where there are APIs that allow you to spin up these container clusters, and that it supports both Docker Swarm and Kubernetes. And we're using Heat, again, to provide the orchestration of these services. And they have, as, as was, I think Mark Collier also mentioned, you know, this is running on what's known as a bay, which is where then the environment for the containers uh, operating system works. And this allows us to basically use both kinds of, of image-based deployments at the same time. Another interesting service is COLA. This is where we're looking at, well, what if it, one of the issues that we have, I think, in, in OpenStack, as we all know, is the manageability and availability of these services. And so what if we use some of the technology that's coming out of the container world to help with the manageability of OpenStack services itself? So in this way, 
a lot of the work that we're doing here is to run the OpenStack services, Nova, Glance, Cinder, inside of a container. That allows us to put the container in a cluster of machines and allows us to do things such as more easily run one version of Nova upgrade from Havana um, to Kilo at the same time and then start to switch things over. So in this kind of a model, I think we're looking very deeply into this to understand is this a better model for how we actually deploy the OpenStack services themselves. And so again, I urge you to take a look at the project all of these, oh, and this is just a model. One of the interesting things about deployment of OpenStack, if you think of the application space and what we're doing with CI, CD to deploy applications, we would like to be able to do that for OpenStack itself. <coughs> so the CI, CD pipeline becomes very important. And that, again, feeds very well into the whole model of containers. Can containers are meant to ease the whole integration, deployment, rapid deployment of applications and application changes in a very, very lightweight fashion. And this, if this allows us to do that for OpenStack services itself, that's where a lot of the power is going to be. So with all of this, we've got a larger number of things that we are doing. And we've got a larger and larger systems in different kinds of application spaces. So this is where it becomes much more imperative to really talk about how we're getting the stats out of the system, being able to use analytics, being able to dynamically create these things and use visualization. So some of the work that, that's been coming out of some of my team also, you can check is AVOS, where it really integrates both visualization and advanced analytics capabilities into running on top of OpenStack so you can get a better view of what's going on. And being able to run some of these services both at the system level and at the application level, I think is important. Um, as we increase these number of services and microservices, again, we have more and more need for this. So one of the simple ones uh, we've been working on lately is something called Cloud Pulse, and we just start, launched this the other day uh, as another project. Um, think of this as a monitor, a health monitor for your OpenStack cloud. So that just like in an intensive care, or you go into any kind of hospital, or whatever, you're always hearing these like beep, beep, beep. That means the patient's still alive. The cloud's still up. If that ever stops or goes to a high-pitched whine, <laughs> you know your cloud is in deep trouble. And so Cloud Pulse is where we're gathering a lot of these metrics and, again, working with things like Monasca and everything else, being, bringing those together so that you can have a health check of the system. And provide this health check, again, at a much more detailed level for the application providers. Because the worst thing you want to do is, is running an application on top of a cloud and you have a problem. And you go, is it my problem? or is it a problem in the cloud? So by increasing our level of visibility around the analytics that's taking place in the cloud platform itself, we'll make it easier for application providers uh, to understand whether their application is at fault or whether it's something going on in the cloud. And as we get closer to that, understanding what that fault might be so that they can take action. And it shouldn't be to call up the cloud provider or your IT department and say, I've got a problem here. You can increasingly use automation than to get possibly move virtual machines out of an area that's having a problem and move them to a, a healthier place. So OpenStack keeps expanding. And, and this is viewed sometimes as a you know, benefit or a curse. More and more services are coming along. I think that we've, you probably heard talk about you know, this big tent concept where we want to have more and more services become available, provided they are adhering to the principles that we have around open source. And so this might be confusing at some place, but I view this again as opportunity. And that what we have is that new things that are coming on in terms of data processing, and Murano is an application catalog that we're now seeing being tied in in what we're doing with containers. This becomes a much more, more powerful platform that we are working on. So the real challenge here, I think, is that with these ever-growing number of possibilities and opportunities, is essentially, can we keep it together? I mean, can we find the right balance between simultaneously moving towards carrier-grade, inter enterprise-ready, solid, resilient cloud platforms as we continue to expand and grow the number of services? I think to do that, we have to take much more of an overall architectural view of how these services put, put together and, and really you know, focus on what is going to ultimately end up with the true value to the end user customer. 
By the way, I'm just getting the sign to close off, but I think there will be time for questions. So if you do have a question or whatever, we do have a mic up in here before I close. So more than anything, what I'd like us to do as a community is to find that balance and work on both of those layers, both towards increasing resiliency and availability of the platform and scale, at the same time as we don't, to accomplish that, we shouldn't shut off all innovation because I think the innovation that is coming is very, very real and providing very, very high value. So finding the right balance between those two, and those of you who are contributors into, into the OpenStack community, it'd be great if you really recognize that you should be working on both those things. That way also, as we bring in new services, we want to, we want to emphasize those services that are actually increasing the resiliency and availability of the platform. That's the ideal world. So with that, I'll try to open it up for questions, but thank you very much. <laughs> questions, anyone? Yeah, or shout it out, I'll, I'll repeat it. We'll go. Okay, so let me, I'll repeat the question. So Cisco is known for its um, routers and switches and, and proprietary systems, essentially, even though Linux has been used inside of Cisco's routers for years and years. So we've been a big consumer of open source software. I think that what we're seeing now is that we want to be much more of a participant in the open source communities. And your question, I think, is around, so how does that translate into a business model for Cisco? Because if Cisco is helping essentially putting all of this technology out back into the open source. Anybody can use that. So how does that create particular value for Cisco in a, in a business model? I think many companies are, are struggling with that same question. Um, and I think that we're, we are all recognizing, though, there's something new going on here in, in kind of community-driven so development. Uh, standards bodies have existed for years and years because the industry recognized rather than inventing 25 different ways to plug into an electrical outlet, we can make more money in our individual companies if we standardize on those places where you interconnect. So interop has always been driven by standards. Well, the new interop now is when we're creating software platforms is for the, develop the applications that run on top. So I think Cisco very much believes we are working with customers. Many of our customers who are deploying OpenStack, uh, they are buying a lot of Cisco gear to do that, and we are providing our expertise and support in there. We also have provided a lot of plugins which allow us to integrate into Cisco systems. So we fundamentally will be competing on OpenStack works best on Cisco. Cisco is not just about routers and switches. We also have servers and storage. So we very much want to provide assistance and, and capabilities back into the platform. That will make OpenStack work great on top of an integrated environment delivered by Cisco. Um, we also think it's just very important to, to have this kind of community-driven development. I think that if you look at the number of companies, whether it be HP, Intel, Dell, that we are all working together, and we've decided it's better for us to work together and grow cloud computing than it is for us to create a million different kind of cloud standards out there which I think will hurt the industry long term. Follow on question. Unless somebody else is willing to stand up. <laughs> and here we are here at the Cisco Business Modeling Center. So I came up with the Cisco Business Modeling Center. Cisco's been at 65% margins. I think I know where you're going with this. So Cisco has always said that if you want to get into the service industry, you have to have a low margin. So now you're saying what the customers are building. Okay, well, as a Cisco investor, let me address that. So, <laughs> so yeah, with, 60, with, the, with the business model that sort of demands that we maintain very, very high margins, you have to create very, very high value. That's the only way you can do that. So, for example, what we're doing with our intercloud strategy is rather than Cisco standing up our own clouds and making all that, we are making that investment with service providers around the world because what we see, Cisco has a global reach, Guess what? We're a networking company. We connect the globe. 
So it makes perfect sense for Cisco to have a strategy around cloud computing of creating a global network of intercloud nodes. That's what we're essentially calling. So we are making, you've seen a number of announcements that we've made about partnerships with many of the largest telco service providers around the world where Cisco is going to be building a cloud there, connecting these clouds together. And they're primarily, their focus there is, however, not to compete directly with Amazon and even Google, which can do this a huge, huge volume. And, and instead, our business model is to focus on the business applications. So it's much more about providing the business services on top of those. Those services are largely, for many of those telcos, they're business networking services. They're connectivity, it's VPNs, it's those kinds, you know, direct data links, it's those kinds of services, and then our own businesses around collaboration and around security. Many of Cisco's new businesses are cloud-based businesses. You look at Meraki, how we're, with Meraki, that is, being, that is managing Wi-Fi access points from the cloud. So we see our future growth is in terms of these cloud businesses, and that's how I think that we'll be able to maintain a successful company. Time's out. I will be available out in the hall if you want. Thank you very much. <laughs>